Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to this last minute talk. Apparently, the original presenter wasn't able to make it, so they put me on the slot. Um, and I thought this would be a good, I want this to be discussion. I don't want it to be super me presenting to you all. Um, I would prefer if we discuss it a bit. Um, I have been starting to give this presentation publicly a bit, and this is really like the culmination of, we've literally been planning and working on RHEL 10 since RHEL 9, basically, but, but we started, I'll, I'll give you a bit about the journey, just because I think it's good for DevConf. So 24 months ago, I started interviewing all of the product managers in the RHEL team. Um, and so I basically asked every product manager, hey, in fact, I started to collect survey data from the product managers because there's enough product managers and there's thousands of engineers involved in RHEL and to like get a lay of the land of where we think we are and what we think we can achieve. So I started to ask each of the subject matter experts in their different areas. Like we had somebody that's working on cloud stuff. We have somebody that's working on security policies, somebody that's working on, uh, you know, deeper security stuff. I don't know, performance stuff. There's, there's, there's roughly 20, 25 product managers in RHEL to give you an idea of the size and scope of how big RHEL is. And then, you know, each of those product managers are working with, Red Hat is a pretty high number of engineers to PMs. Like at a startup, there might be five or seven or 10 engineers at Red Hat. I think it, I, I, I've, I've heard it measured in the like 100 engineers to one PM. Um, you know, it's like crazy high. Um, so you can imagine 25 PMs, that's probably like, I don't know, it's a huge chunk of, that's a lot of engineers. Um, and so like to get a lay of the land, I started to interview everyone. That was about 24 months ago. And then we kind of started iterating on that and seeing like, what do we think we can achieve filtered by like, what do we think we can achieve? What do we think is the next most important thing to achieve for customers? And we did it in a bunch of different subject matter expert areas like SAP, for example, we, or workloads. We have a workloads team that is like dedicated to like all these enterprise workloads, security, et cetera. So it started with that. And I think that qualitative, I started to do qualitative research essentially because my background was in anthropology. Then we moved on to like starting to talk to customers and partners and then even other business units within Red Hat. So if you think about RHEL as a platform for everybody, right? Like it's a platform for customers, which is where we make a lot of our money. But our partner ecosystem is hugely important to making sure that RHEL is valuable to those customers. And then also it is super valuable to like OpenShift and all the other stuff that we build at Red Hat. So like I, I saw a talk downstairs where somebody was using UBI. Uh, and I was like, yes, this is awesome. Like people are using UBI, which is basically RHEL. So you kind of look at these constituencies, customers, partners, other business units and projects and things. Um, and that's, we started to get feedback from all of them. And that was probably 18 months ago. Um, and I will then now, what this talk goes through is kind of the summary of all of that that I'd come to. And we've done iterative feedback sessions with customers. And so the, I, I'm not committing to anything, of course, standard product management speak. But, uh, but this is sort of uh, something I think I'm comfortable sharing publicly. Um, so to like level set, like what the RHEL BU views itself as when we talk to customers. So like we view it as a very simple mission statement, which we never had for many years, but it's to be just a secure and safe, you know, reliable platform essentially for workloads because people don't care about running operating systems. They care about running workloads. They run an operating system because they have to, right? Like they just want to connect hardware to their workload and that thing in between happens to be the, the glue, which is RHEL, and Linux in general, and operating systems in general. So in all of the discussions I had with all the product managers in our team, engineers, other business units, customers, partners, I started to see some narratives form. Like, and, and then I guess even filter it through like the projects that we were working on, like Image Builder and RHEL Image Mode, and now RHEL Lightspeed, for example, um, which if you don't know what it is, I'll dig into a little bit. You go back to 1999, I jokingly generated these images, obviously, but this reminds me of myself in 1999, and the way I pitched this is there was a sysadmin sitting in front of a single computer with a DVD, or even worse, like still floppy disks to an extent. Actually, I had to feed like bazillions of CDs into like an IREX box back then. We had this giant IREX box and updated it as a nightmare. But um, it was essentially, you could think of a sysadmin was writing a very small check for their organization. They were like sitting in front of a single computer with a single human being and a single CD and all of the information embedded on that CD, clicking next, 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 or selecting yes, no in, on a command, you know, li like literally an install script. And I was, I, you were essentially expending the company's resources, a very small chunk of the company's resources, right, for the decisions that you were making at that moment in time. And, uh, and, I, and Ben Briard has a good joke. He says, you know, at the time, like, if your grep skills were badass, you like, like, that was like, or if your set and aux skills were badass, you were like really cool then. 
Like now, if you brag about that, people will make fun of you. Like, because if you go to today, the skill set is so broad, right? Like I've only got two minutes to think of about any one small component because it's not just a single server in a single room. It is thousands of servers with thousands of workloads running across huge spanses of time. You know, whereas a server may have ran three to five, maybe 10 years back then, and you pretty much didn't touch it after year two or three, it just kind of ran DNS forever. Um, you know, you, go, you forward to today and the life cycles are crazy. People beg us to go 20 years, 30 years for row, which is impossible to do with open source software, I would argue today. Um, but they want it, like there is demand to go that long. And you're seeing other competitors increase their life cycle. You can see the market demand, it's plainly obvious. But it's not just the length of time, it's the breadth of problems that you have. Like, um, and I'll give you an example. You know, you have like hundreds and hundreds or thousands of workloads across 100,000 servers or whatever. You change network, I'll give you an example of a problem that happens. So we had a customer, they, had, they were building a bunch of automation for a network for network configs. Network configs are extremely unique in that they are a pain in the butt because they are different everywhere. Like you need data to feed the IP blocks that you need for your thousands of servers and they're all different or at least there's huge families of them that are different, right? You may have one IP range over here, another IP range over there, another IP range over here, another IP range there. And so it's very, it's a lot of branching logic to do this, right? So it is, the data is important and the config file format is important. They came to us and they said, hey, we want to automate this. We said, cool, that sounds great. Like, automate it. Automate away. RHEL's great to automate. Like, three months later, we dropped RHEL 9, and we moved from, like, the old scripts to Network Manager, and they went, Bruh! like, they exploded with infuriation because they spent all this time and money basically automating this very complex thing across thousands of servers, and three months later, everything changed, and they're like, great, well, this investment was, like, basically useless. So it's, like, spatial and temporal in nature is the problem, right? So, like, if you look at this guy on the right, you know, with all these people, it's, and it's not just network configs, it's much more complicated things where there's a DBA, there's a network admin, there's a sysadmin that has to handle stuff at 2 a.m., there's a network, there is a network architect, there's a automation architect now, there are security people involved. There's all of these SMEs that have to collaborate to build this thing in time. And so you look like, on the right, on the left, this is like one dude sitting, that was me in 1999. Now it's like literally you're talking about $50,000, $100,000 investments to make changes across your, serv you know, your, your giant platform, right? So like the way customers think about this is completely different now. And they're annoyed if you're not helping them both spatially and temporally into the future. That's kind of, so that's basically what I came to as I interviewed like bazillions of people trying to like figure out like what are we going to solve next in RHEL? So then we started to develop some themes, basically, in a nutshell. We, uh, we know that there are four, we've kind of broken down everything that we're working on into four themes. Now, mind you, I'm, a, I'm like an automation, previous sysadmin, long-time sysadmin, so like I built reports internally in Confluence so I can watch and see all of the features and market problems that we're solving and all of these things. So I have an internal Confluence it's dashboard that I look at pretty much every day and I organize everything that we're doing with. Um, and it falls into these four buckets. And then I have descriptions all very similar to these in each bucket. And I just keep refocusing everyone. Like these are the four main things we're trying to solve. So connected experience. Forget these names. Internally, I will fully admit, I call them pillar one, two, three, and four. And I just know them by number because as an engineer, I don't, I, like the names change, but the number just stays. I just don't want to embed metadata in the pillars, but I have to because now we're in the marketing world where I need to explain it to you, you know, publicly. Um, but, uh, but in a nutshell, the, the sort of the first pillar, I would say, is about all of the technology. It's things like RHEL Lightspeed, RHEL Image Mode, which is Boot C. It is about RHEL Image Builder, which if you haven't used it, is something you log into console.redhat.com and you build images of RHEL in a sort of a hermetic environment as opposed to having to set up something yourself. Um, so if you want to build an Azure image, you don't need to set up like an Azure dev environment. You can literally just build an image for Azure inside of you know, image builder, and it's pretty cool because it builds it the right way that it will run well there, um, which is actually something that one of the customers told me when we were doing our early interviews of like what they liked and didn't like. So uh, that's about all the tooling, essentially. The second one is about content. Like we know there are temporal and spatial problems with content. I need more content, I need it to move faster, I need this content to move faster, I need that content to move slower. I call it the too fast, too slow problem. Um, we just talked about it earlier. Probably everyone in this room has heard that 
like open source, and really all software has a problem of either it moves too fast for some people, it moves too slow for others. And when you have thousands and thousands or hundreds of thousands of users, it's always gonna be wrong for everyone a little bit. And so you've gotta to get to a place where it's kinda right. So if you look at the way RHEL is broken down today, it is uh, base OS is the main channel, and then there is app stream. And there are sort of some, these have evolved a little bit, I would argue. Like when we launched RHEL 8, there was pretty strict definitions of what those are. And then as we've evolved through 9 and we're moving into 10, like they get a little more nebulous and they change. Um, Brian Galahar, one of our PMs, uh, product managers, he was brilliant in that I think he called it app stream as opposed to like modules, as opposed to software collections. It was a third party name, if you will, that like isn't the technology. In this particular case, it was brilliant because it worked out really well because we went from you know basically software collections to modules. Now we're moving to like actually just named RPMs mostly. Um, and so like the tech that ch changes of how you install the package, but the life cycle and promises that you get from it don't. Like if you install an app stream, you kind of know what promise you're getting. I'm getting Python 3.9 or 3.11 or whatever, and it's supported for roughly one to three years. You know, like, like app streams kind of give you about that guarantee. They're not the same as base OS, which is the 10 year guarantee. And so, you know, you kind of understand what you're getting. Um, in RHEL 10, we plan on adding a third family of content called extensions, which will be, uh, which will, there's two components. They'll probably be, again, some of this is sausage being made, so I have no guarantees here, but likely it will be a bunch of content from Apple, likely the content that has a Red Hatter's name next to it already, um, because we don't just want to support anything. And it will also probably be supported at a lower tier um, of support, not sort of what you expect from AppStream and BaseOS, but something lower than that. Probably something along the lines of start-stop support. Um, like, yes, we love it. We put our arm around it. We love it. You should use it. It's good. But it is definitely the roadmap and the life cycle comes from the upstream and it will start and stop and it will install. And, you know, that's kind of the original value prop of distros if you go back 20 years anyway. Um, and so we think that will help expand a bunch of content and add a lot of content to RHEL to make it easier. Um, but it will still not increase our support burden in a lot of ways because there's always this power meter problem of that. Um, so that's what the composability pillar is about. The third one is coaching, we call it coaching through complexity, or I call it pillar three, is about simplifying policy. So if the, I'll, I'll get into the connected experience, the first one, but I think REL Lightspeed will simplify consumption of our policy and how a customer can think about scaling thousands of servers over 10 years, like in looking at their entire fleet and analyzing it, because they'll be able to take a specific build and analyze that build and see how it's gonna change over time in REL Lightspeed. I think that will be a super useful feature, which I'll get deeper into. But that's about taking a tool and making it easier to use the software. And I think coaching through complexity is about simplifying the policy that feeds into that. So if you look at RHEL today, there's a, you can kind of understand, like I mentioned with base OS and app stream, you can kind of like loosely infer what that means, but it's not super well defined and no tool anywhere will like just analyze your image and tell you exactly what your lifecycle guarantees are for every package. Like today, what you have to do is you have to log into the portal. I jokingly say you have to look at nine different documents. You have to ha look at a hardware support list. You have to look at a software support list if you're building for a specific vendor workload. You have to look at the uh, application compatibility guide and know what tier of software you have to look at. If you get it all the way down in the containers world where I came from, there's like six more documents because you're like, well, I'm using the Docker API in Podman, and like, what level of guarantee do I get for that? And then I'm using UBI Rel, UBI 9 on RHEL 8. Like, does that work? So you got to do the container compatibility matrix, and it just gets crazy. Like, there's like nine different documents that a sysadmin or an architect would have to read. Now, again, go back to my first slide. It's not a single person. It's a team of subject matter experts, and they all need to grok nine documents to understand what policy they need to adhere to to like make sure they're in a good place and supported with Red Hat. Wouldn't it be much easier if one, that policy was simplified so that there were like three documents instead of nine or one main document that maybe fed other documents. Um, so that third pillar is about simplifying that policy. The last one is about the incremental improvements, including some of the things that we tear out or, or deprecate. Uh, and there, there's always that constant improvement in the bits that we just have to do. There has to be a new kernel, a new system D, there has to be, the network config files have to change sometimes. Um, so it's about, like we want everyone to know that that work is super important and we still value that at the highest of levels. 
but, but the other ones are about simplifying how you consume and build rel. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, we're hoping, like for example, uh, you know, I jokingly say like if rel light speed succeeds, rel 11 will be amazing because I won't have to actually give roadmaps anymore. You'll just like build an image, say show me the roadmap for this image. Like show me this specific image, show me the release notes, one, that apply to this specific image with this specific software, and then show me how it's gonna change over time. The release notes show me what changed up to this point, and then I can hopefully analyze what happens in the future. Like, oh look, the config files changed with three months when RHEL 9 comes out. Because three months before RHEL 9 launched, we already knew that. Like, we kind of knew. Like, the bits were already there, they weren't separate streams. Same with RHEL 10, right? It's already there, we just need to analyze it and be able to show you how your specific box changed up till this point with this release notes, and then into the future. And if we can simplify the policy and use rel speed to do that, I think that's game changing. Like that is probably the biggest thing that rel is trying to do. It's trying to get to that point. So that then I don't have to get yelled at anymore. Like I don't want to I like I like getting yelled at, but not that much. So I show this slide because I think this ties it all together. Um, in a nutshell, if you look at the the marquee features, I would say are like rel image mode. Image, which is Bootsy, image builder, which is the tool that you log into console.redhat.com, and then rel lightspeed to analyze the images. And then also there's some other capabilities, and there will be some capabilities in rel lightspeed around even enabled, you know, uh, I hate saying the word AI, but an AI enabled shell. Um, I've tried to disregard saying that word as much as humanly possible. But um, in a nutshell, you can kind of see it here. Like, how can we make this group of people's lives better? I've mentioned that it's not a single sysadmin. It's all of these people doing their job, like the storage admin, network admin, and, and database admin, and enterprise architect have to collaborate to build the image, right? They have to go back and haggle and fight and argue about like their policies and what's right, what's wrong, and how does it need to change when they upgrade from rel 8 to rel 9 to rel 10. Um, and then the sysadmin, poor, poor person, they have to like handle all of that at 2 a.m., right? And there's internal tension there even between, between uh, I believe the mic went out. Oh, there it is. So, even the poor sysadmin has like at 2 a.m., you know, something's broken and then they're like, they're like, this stupid enterprise architect. You know, like, like there's like rage because it got designed in some weird way that wasn't, you know, it, nobody was really empathetic to like what it would look like at 2 a.m. with no documentation and something's broken, you know, in some weird way. So like we want to facilitate better arbitration between these people essentially. And we think that if you kind of tie all this together, you can kind of see, imagine simplified policy, which I don't have on here, Overlaying, you know, an image-based rel, which you can deploy, which I can dig into, like, how many of you are familiar with Boot C? Let me say that. Okay, decent amount, but not everybody. So let me explain. So rel image mode is the product name for Boot C, and so all product managers like me must say the product name, even though it confuses everyone, so I'm sorry for that. But um, Boot C is essentially a way of, you take Podman or Docker, you can basically slap an application into a container image, lay it down on disk and run it. Bootsy is a way of taking the actual OS, cramming it in a container image, pulling it down, and running it on the hardware. So you can imagine, like, I can pull an image down, run it on the hardware, pull an image down, run an app, slap those three things together, and now it's nice and modular. You can also do fancier things, like, at build time, maybe suck a container image into the Bootsy image, which is actually a container image, pull that whole thing down, and then run the, you know, boot up the operating system, and then run a container image inside. But it's composable. I would call it like composition, ver you know, it, I, I'm going back to my old computer science words, but it's like composition and whatever the other one is. Uh, inheritance, yes, yes. So um, we think that that will help simplify the job of these people planning this out, right? Because now I can build a development version of RHEL, ship it to basically say, hey, it's in the risk registry server, pull it down network admin and tell me how I did this wrong. You know, and then the network admin will say, ah, it's broken in this way, blah, 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 I actually changed this. They'll and they might do that with automation, they might do it manually, whatever, but they can haggle like, about it as they're in that development cycle of like moving to RHEL 10 or moving to RHEL 11, um, or even moving a dot release, you know, even going 10 to 10.1. And so we think that will help essentially become a nice mechanism for collaboration for the, all these people over here. And then imagine if I can have my buddy analyze it, you know, Mr. RHEL Lightspeed or Ms. RHEL Lightspeed or Mrs. RHEL Lightspeed, I don't know what it is, but but you can have a buddy you know, that comes along with you and then helps you analyze like what has changed on this, what release notes apply to this specific thing, those kinds of things. Um, 
and so that you know what your responsibilities are, what Red Hat's responsibilities are, and you can better understand it. Because there's not a single person on this side that needs to know that. It's all of these people, right? Because a storage admin is like, what piece is mine? I, one tiny little driver is all I care about. Network admin, that, the rest of it, that network stuff is yours, and enterprise architect, the rest of it's all yours, right? Like, and so everybody's always looking at, like, what is my problem, and what is your problem? And it's all about assigning, you know, assigning responsibility. And so we hope that we can use Rail Lightspeed to help do that. And then, again, we hope that like Podman Desktop will be a nice place to build these base images, right? Because if the container workflow was beautiful. Like, we loved it. It was great. It allowed, it allowed collaboration between a bunch of different types of developers. A DBA, you know, you could pull a database image. You could slap a web app together, and you might have 20 web developers all collaborating on what's in that container, right? They might all be committing code to GitHub and then pulling it down in that container, creating a release artifact, shipping that around. If you really think of the business value of containers, it was all that collaboration that that facilitated and how much easier that collaboration was. When you threw it over the wall, you kind of knew it was going to work now. We hope to do that to the OS itself in RHEL 10. And you know, in a nutshell, I, I say this slide kind of shows it all. Um, how much time do I have? Uh, like 10 more-ish? Yeah, uh, that's what I was thinking. All right, I think I will, I, I, I will go to like just a couple more slides, I think. So like image mode, like to give you an idea of what it looks like. What does this look like? Dan Walsh will get mad if I call it what I think it looks like. It's a I think it's a container file, yeah. I don't have the swear jar, so I'm not going to say it. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you get the gist, right? Like look at this. I can pull an image. I can do some things. I can add an application. I can add some configuration files, configuration scripts. Boom, done. This makes RHEL beautiful to build, right? Like this makes the base OS super easy to build. And I think the value is pretty intrinsically understood. If you already understand containers, you're like, oh, this is beautiful. And then what if I have my friend, you know, in Image Builder help me like export this thing to like a QCOW2 or an ISO or whatever I want, right? Like if I can just lay this thing down on disk really easily or ship it out to, uh, you know, to Amazon or, or Azure or whatever I want to like run it, that's pretty nice. Um, and then, you know, you could start to see what your build workflow looks like, right? Like, I'll use a container file with an E at the end, which I now need to change, apparently. But, uh, you know, you can see, like, I take my container file. That's my artifact that I've collaborated on with all these other subject matter experts. I build the image. I shove it in a container registry. I convert it to something. I lay it down on any one of these devices. That's pretty cool. But that's not really, I mean, that's cool. The, the collaboration there is really nice. But then I would argue the update mechanism is what's really cool. Like, you're like, okay, uh, what's an update look like now? Single change to a config, you know, to a container file. The rest happens, and now we can get into like a GitOps workflow where we start to control those config, those container files in Git, and then on commit, I can have it go through a CI/CD system, and then that container image doesn't actually get shoved into the registry until it passes that. That looks a lot more like what developers do, right? Like that's what we've wanted with the OS for a long time, and so now we can do it to the base OS too, not just the app that's on top of it. And so the other thing that I want to point out is we think that like image builder is a really convenient place to have like a hermetically sealed, I don't know why it keeps doing this, but a image builder is a really nice place to have a hermetically sealed. I had a, I had a customer tell us that like he loves it for building for Azure because he doesn't want to have to set up a virtualization environment that's identical to Azure, right? Like he just wanted it to work. He's like, I just want to build an image. Um, now imagine if in an image builder you can build an image like this in that hermetically sealed environment. I know what I built is actually for Azure. I could ship it out into a container registry if I want, push it out. Um, I, could, I could maybe export it directly as an ISO. But like giving anybody the freedom they want to do it the way they want to do it. Like we, we sort of have a principle in RHEL, like bring innovation but don't leave people behind. So I definitely don't want to leave my ISO people behind, but I do want to offer the option of using container files in and OCI artifacts or container images um, to, you know, basically as the build artifact as opposed to an ISO. And I think that's what, when you kind of combine all these technologies and then you look at what we're doing, uh, that's kind of the gist of RHEL 10. Um, one last one. I think I've explained RHEL Lightspeed enough, but like um, we want to, there's a couple of like pillars that Brian Smith has. He's the PM lead for RHEL Lightspeed. Like some of it is we definitely want to help people troubleshoot. We definitely want to help people level up their skills, and we definitely want to help people plan and deploy. Like, we definitely want those things. Um, and so, like, whether you're senior or junior, we think we can help level up. Like, if you have an AI-enabled shell, that helps a lot with, like, complex, nasty, you know, options, command line options, things like that. 
that was like one of the first things we looked at, but I wasn't super excited with just that, like being REL AI, because the business problem that the customer actually has is a lot in the planning side, right? So like we wanted to help solve the architect problem, which is the planning side and the sysadmin problem, which is 2 a.m. So we think like an AI enabled shell will help people at 2 a.m. We think that the, the what we're calling sort of loosely the digital roadmap is, uh, is the ability to show people release notes and future things that are happening in REL for your specific build. Um, that will help the planning process, right? And I think those are the two big business problems that we're like sort of solving there. With that, I will stop and say, I think that is enough REL 10, and I will say, let's talk if you want. I actually was hoping it would be a talk like more interactive, but does anybody have any questions? How many of you work for Red Hat? A lot, yeah. I like it, all the people in the front don't, that's cool. Hello. Yes. Thank you. Um, so a lot of a lot of what you've shown us uh, is, I mean, uh, following uh, or trying to bring Rel 10 into a more Div Git GitOps operation, DevOps operation, as you mentioned, right? A lot of it depends on actually services that are around. Are you are you thinking that this can also happen in, I mean, completely disconnected environments? I mean, are, are the, is the infrastructure that is around this view this vision? Also being built so that I mean customers that are still uh, wanting to be I mean in their own basements doing their own thing disconnected from the world be able to do just the same and have the same experience. Yes, that is a wonderful question. I will say one of the reasons why I like doing these talks at like a DevConf is because I try to express the empathy. So I will say like I won't name names, but one of the customers I talked to was so they can't even use Rel Lightspeed. They won't be able to use a model even on premise. Like it's so strict that they would have to like have the model locally, analyze it for three to six months, move it through some kind of software life cycle, and then it would be approved to use internally. And that's the only way they would use it. So like first answer is we're not getting rid of documentation. Like thou shalt not get rid of the doc, doc. Our principle is do not leave people behind. There are going to be people that just need to use regular documentation and still need to do all those manual processes. Let's say that is bucket one of people that we do not want to leave behind. And then I will express bucket two and three, which is, you're right, MVP will likely just be online. Like, it'll probably be an image builder. That'll probably be the best we get. But I will say, Brian Smith, who is the PM for Roll Lightspeed, is very sympathetic to the on-premise problem. And I suspect his roadmap will quickly pivot into, like, how do we bring it on site? How do we facilitate that kind of thing? You know, because we know that at the... The, the strictest of customers won't be able to use it all. That's just a fact. The next bucket will probably be able to use it, but if it goes through some kind of like software lifecycle approval process internally. And then a, then a third group of people, we, we also discovered and I validated with a bunch of customers, like I could use it at build time, I cannot use it at production. Like I'm not sending you data on my production. But during my build, how different is it that I do a build internally, I get the container file out, and then I build it locally? But at least I used all of your intelligence, which is not that different than reading your documentation and your release notes and all that. Like you really, it's like about where does the knowledge live? Does it live in my brain or is it embedded in that container file? And then can I take that container file on premise and then rebuild it all locally, still knowing that I did all the stuff right because I built it in your hermetic environment. And so like, I think it's about what, what artifact is portable. Is it only the knowledge in my brain is portable between your documentation site and me? Or can I take that container file and go, yeah, I can read that container file. That's pretty cool. I'll, I'll run that thing through and it, it works the right way. So we've thought deeply about that problem, basically. So being a front man right here. Um, so uh, this rel bootsy image, uh, that has the Linux kernel, the rel kernel in it, and it has you know, rel system D and packages that are not usually in UBI. So does this mean that the kernel and the entire operating system is now available as content for everybody? Very good question, and thank you for throwing a curveball at me. Uh, I launched UBI. I love UBI. UBI is my baby. Um, but no, we will not be adding a kernel in system D to UBI. It will still be RHEL, and it will still require a subscription. And yes, you will probably need to understand those rules a bit, like of like what... Mind you, you don't, you've never needed a subscription to move an ISO around, right? Like you can have a rel ISO laying on an NFS server or whatever, Samba share if you want. But when you, go to, when you go to run it on a server, that's when you need a subscription. So I think it's actually pretty easy to deal with for the most part. Um, it's a container file, and an OCR artifact, and you can kind of have those everywhere. But when you go to run it, that's when, you, that's when you need a subscription. Although we're also making that simpler. We're actually 
really contemplating, like, like Rich Dorito's team has worked an immense amount on simplifying subscription management and what actual business processes are necessary. Like, for example, can we just give every account 50, you know, developer subscriptions or can they just have developer subscriptions automatically so that you can just build things? You know, like we're definitely investigating a bunch of interesting stuff there to make that easier. All right, one follow-up question then, I'll ask him. So RHEL 10 is going to last for the next 10, 15 years, and I'm really worried about quantum computing coming in and basically breaking into all the security and the systems because it's so freaking fast. What do you got to say about that? We are definitely working on post-quantum crypto. Uh, that's one of the big ones that I, I, we, I mentioned, the different subject matter experts in our PM group, Amy Farley. Uh, I am definitely, that is on my list of things for the RHEL 10 launch under incremental improvements or under, you know, strengthening the foundation. Uh, we need that to land. And I'll throw out another curveball, FIPS. FIPS should get much easier if everything that I want lands uh, in RHEL. We are moving to a very small modular FIPS design that will actually make UBI super easy to turn on FIPS when it moves on to a RHEL box. So I'd say like quantum, post-quantum crypto is a big one for me, the, the simplified FIPS Stuff is a big one for me. There are some a bunch of little small improvements I didn't I didn't bring. I don't even call those small. They're important security improvements, but they're like strengthening the foundation. They're not about changing the way we deploy or manage row. I was going to ask about FIPS, but you basically answered yes. my question. Right now, FIPS is pretty tough in a containerized world, and so we're trying to simplify it. Like it should get much easier by, in fact, even maybe rel 9.5. And also, everything I say for this stuff is not necessarily specific to RHEL 10. Some of this stuff will land in RHEL 9. Like, it won't just be RHEL 10. But when it all comes together in RHEL 10, like the vision, you can kind of see where we're steering the ship as opposed to, like, what speedboats are in the water. Uh, hey, Scott, how will upgrades work from 9 to 10? Well, they won't work terribly different than they work today. And the way that works today is we have sort of, we have this upgrades team that basically goes and talks to all the different subsystem teams and makes sure that all of the subsystem teams within RHEL kind of have an upgrade plan, as Dan Walsh and I know, because we got beat up when we moved from uh, Docker, or not Docker, Pod, well, when we moved from Docker to Podman, we got beat up. And then when we moved from Podman three to four, I think it was, like we got beat up because there was a change to the database. So long story short is it is a distributed process where each subsystem team is responsible for trying to make their stuff as easy to upgrade as possible, although there are exceptions because sometimes it's impossible. So like that process really doesn't change much in real time. Although I would say Leap is getting better and better. I would say it's gotten a lot better and it's actually quite awesome. So I don't want to undersell it. So if, if I'm a customer and I'm on um, like a traditional rel machine and I want to migrate to the new image mode rel, how can I do that? Say that one more time if you're a what? Customer? So if I'm on like um, traditional um, rel. Where Just regular package rel. Package rel, yeah, 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 yeah that's, yeah, yeah. that's what we mode. call it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, and I want, I want to migrate to an image-based world because I want my operating system to be, as you said, go through a CI workflow, immutable, secure, and all that. How yeah. do I do that? Yeah, I think so it's a little bit of a choose your own adventure. We want to be flexible, but I would say I see two main front doors to that. I've been calling them the front doors to rel. Historically the front doors to rel have been go download an ISO, right? And go down go to the access.redhat.com, find the download page, download. It. That's the single front door. In rel 10, hopefully it will be a a, a front door of like go to console.redhat.com, use image builder or go to podman desktop, pull a, a bootsy image, and I think those will be the two main front doors. That's about as much as I can do with them as time we have. <laughs>